sitting here talking at you. I do a lot of talking at people uh, as a lecturer at Richard Ben. And so I really want to try and you know involve everybody and say everybody kind of move to the front, but we're, we're pretty good space-wise. I'm really kind of surprised about the turnout being this huge. Well, that's a lot of people, but that's okay. Um, anyway, so uh, at DigiPen, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about what uh, DigiPen is kind of all about and what I do there and how that fits in with uh, software craftsmanship or just software engineering in general. Um, at DigiPen, it's more of a trade school than a traditional four-year college. We are teaching people specifically how to be game programmers. And if you can write a game, you can write pretty much anything, almost. Um, and we have other uh, degree programs as well. So students at DigiPen tend to write a whole lot more code because you're focusing on CS classes nonstop all four years. Um, and there's graphics, there's physics, there's lots of other stuff. The math gets pretty crazy after not too much time. But the main thing that uh, DigiPen is kind of known for is the game project. Every year you have a, a year-long project uh, where you work with a team of students to create a game. These games get progressively more and more complicated. And we've had some somewhat well-known ones come out of DigiPen. Um, you're probably familiar with Portal, which started its life as Narbocular Drop, which is a junior project at DigiPen. There was Portal 2, which started its life as Tag the Power of Paint, also a uh, junior project at DigiPen, junior, senior. Um, the most recent one is uh, Distance. It's a racing survival game, formerly Nitronic Rush, also a DigiPen game. You can play all of these on DigiPen's website. The PDU just go there. And there's a, a few others out there that, that won awards and stuff. And so I try to look at every student has to go through these games. And they involve also game design students, artists. We have a sound design program now. All these people coming together. And some of the students succeed spectacularly. They do wonderful things. They have amazing games. They look great. They're fun. And then they go on to sometimes release these uh, uh, games professionally once they graduate. The vast majority of teams have somewhat mediocre games. Nothing to write home about. And then there are a few teams that crash and burn horribly. And I start to wonder why. And, well, I went through the master's program at DigiPen. And uh, I got to do the year-long game project. Actually, two of them. I learned some interesting things about why. I started looking at these student teams more. And I noticed a few different things. One is team organization, just in general, how you run a team. We have a lot of people at DigiPen that we uh, kind of focus on that. There's a very wonderful uh, uh, woman, Rachel Rutherford, who's uh, also a professor at DigiPen, and she uh, does these things called Team on One. She meets with her team and lets get you all on the same track, find out how you can be more productive, how you can run a dev team. She's very much into uh, uh, Agile. She teaches Agile principles all, just a lot. Some great things happening there. So I start to look at some student code, and what do I see? Garbage. And what I've seen in teams that fall apart, I have seen teams that have failed because of no other reason than code. Their code is not good. Why is it not good? I've seen, okay, team lost their graphics programmer. Nobody can understand that code. We have no idea what it does. We know what graphics programming is. What is that matrix? I don't even know what that means, right? Um, I've seen code that is just so unworkable. They cannot change it. They cannot change the game concept. And the game isn't fun. It's one of the most important things in game programming is you have to be able to iterate rapidly. You will not know if your game is fun until people play it. And if it's not fun, go back and change it. And if that takes you six months of rewriting your code to do that, you're done. If it takes you five minutes to do it, that's great. But uh, I've seen students do that too. Their game isn't fun, they completely switch directions, and their code doesn't support it. They're done. I've seen a bunch of students write a whole bunch of code they're not going to need. We're going to write a memory manager. Well, do you need a memory manager for a Tetris clone? <laughs> really? Seriously? You're going to overload, overload Malik and do what? No, don't do that. But students do it. I've seen just bad choices in code. I've seen poorly structured code. I've seen students sit there just for days on end staring at this code. You know, why is this going? Where is that? I'm like, okay, so let's look. Where is that buffer coming from? Oh, look, that's on the stack. No, it's all C++, mostly like DigiPen. Um, and I've seen just like where one assert would have caught this bug in 10 seconds, or one unit test would have fixed this, or just one not having copied and pasted those 800 lines of code. It's actually like 20 lines of code. And I'm like, I'll say to the student, here, here's 800 lines of code. Tell me how these 200 lines and these 200 lines are different. Well, that operation is different, that variable name is different. <laughs> have you heard of functions? They have arguments. Pass a reference, just saying. But uh, anyway, so. 
what makes this relevant is I am in the position where I can fix this. In fact, a lot of people have lamented, why do we not teach software engineering and how to really write good code in college? And I am in a position where I can directly do something about this. So that's uh, kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Because what I've noticed about Bitcoin teams that have been successful is they're really strong with code. They have good communication. Their code is well documented or well commented or just well understood. It works well. It's easy to change. I've seen some very, very extensive unit tests uh, from a certain team to Pitcher who have been successful. I had one, uh, one team where when the game launched, it would actually run their unit test suite and the game would fail to run if any of their tests failed. Right? And their, their tech director would kind of smack down the rest of the team. What I've seen, I've had that one student who uh, uh, was getting the smackdown put on him from the time he was a sophomore in my classes and I've seen him come a long way. Um, so what I want to do is I want to try and get DigiPen students to realize the importance of not, you know, just one, two, three code, do whatever you need to get it done. Ultimately there's time and a place for that. But what I want to know is how can I teach them that? How can I understand, how can I make a student who barely knows how to write four lines of C++ and doesn't know what that constructor actually does, why do they care about unit tests? Why should they? They say, oh, it takes too much time. I don't have time. I want to write a tool. It'll take you, you know, three hours on a weekend to write this tool that will save you so much time going forward. Well, I don't have three hours right now. Okay? Um, solid principles, they're important. Well, I don't need to follow those. Yeah, me. Oh, yeah, no, we are going to need it. You know? No, you're not. Yeah, we are. No, you're not. Um, you know, I see a lot of these things, and students just ignore things that I am certain would help them. And occasionally, I'll show them some things that they can do, and they're like, oh, wow. And then, of course, once they see that pattern, they apply it absolutely everywhere, because when you first learn patterns, who doesn't? So what do you all wish that you learned in college about software engineering? What would it have been great to have been taught? I'm sure college course software engineering, what do you learn? UML. You learn a lot of UML. Here's how I cover UML. That's a box, it's square, stuff goes in it. It's narrow, it can point this way, it can also point that way. There's UML, any questions? All right, we're done. That's my UML lecture. <laughs> all right, so that's, that's actually what my UML lecture is. It's all we really do anyway. So you learn that, you learn waterfall, you learn other SDLCs, you might learn a bit about testing, but nobody focuses on code. And the idea that software you know, is, is a, that writing software is a skill that you should practice, that you should hone, that you should get better at. The idea of software as craftsmanship is so alien to the average college student, it's like they can't even comprehend it. I want them to comprehend it. So how can we do this? What would have worked for you? What did you never even hear of that you wish a college instructor had pointed out? You know, what, uh, what, what do you want out of a college grad coming into the workforce now? What, what would be an important thing that they should learn? So let's open it up to a discussion. Um, what do you all think? What, what was your experience in college? Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't a uh, CS major. I, was, I did philosophy and math. Um, I had one of those classes that I had to take. students that do care a lot about their code, and ultimately they're getting a grade for it, so they care that it works, right? Epidemic of senioritis this year, too. I just wanted you to see, how can I pass? Um, but again, you know, yes, some people really care about that. They don't necessarily care about how can we really make it better, or they'll see a tool and not understand the relevance, or understand how to apply it. Um, so what, they, you said that they cared about code. What made you think that they cared about it more than average team, for example. Or why did you get that sense? No. Um, well, just from people arguing about the design of that design. Mm -hmm. right? If people on the project are arguing about what's better than their passion. 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 Yes, they have passion. <laughs> awesome. Passion is important. I, I've seen students at the who don't have passion for code. My advice to them drop out. Seriously, I've advised two students so far that they should discontinue with the digital One comes to me and says, I hate making games. I love coding, but I hate making games. Okay, UW's right there. You know, you're 
a CS education, it's top quality. Why are you here if you make games? He's like, I don't know. There you go. He's not very All right. Well, you know, one thing for me, anyways, with unit testing is <clears throat> until you get it, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And it seems like such a pain. And so I think, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, when you're teaching somebody to play piano, they got to learn the fingering. Mm -hmm. Until they've got the basics down and they're really comfortable with the piano, they're going to just try and, you know, hunt back the keys. Oh, yeah. Rather than, you know, doing it the right way. And I think you have to sort of, I don't know, beat the right way in. Yeah, so I've actually certainly noticed that. Beating, uh, beating the right way into them. Um, yeah. Recognizing that somebody else may have to read your code. I can't count how many people that just write the code didn't care that it was. They have to read their code. They oh, yeah. Write it and you go through it. They do the function four different ways as you went through the code. And it's like, you get it this way and you go down and make it a different way. Just because it was interesting that they're doing it four different ways. <coughs> oh, yeah. They just yeah. yeah. tank what them. they did. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, totally. Anybody here ever forced to read somebody else's code when they were in school, ever? In a class, you have to read this person's code? Yeah, show of hands. So how many of us professionally have had to walk into a job and had to take over a code base? How many of you wanted to stab whoever wrote it originally after 30 seconds? <laughs> 29 seconds. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And at the gym, I've seen students get burned by that, and so they have become better, or I've seen really strong coders get fired off of teams because nobody can understand what they're doing. Or that guy who never integrates their code, too. Not a, that guy. Um, yeah? Is it a TA that they use out the CSE for about three years, mm -hmm. and I on Wednesday, actually. I asked him what he did besides programming. He said he played basketball. So how many hours of just dribbling do you think Michael Jordan has done in his life? Or how many times he tried to shoot uh, free throws? Or, well, bad example. But, uh, uh, you know, how many hours? I mean, so programming, how many hours of practice have you actually done? If you just code on a real project or a real assignment, something that has to ship, it'd be like learning to play the piano just by performing from the get-go, and the only time you ever practice is when you try to do a performance. Um, quick show of hands, who here has written binary search from scratch, just binary search, in the last year? Anyone? <laughs> who here has written quick sort in the last five years? Outside of a programming interview? <laughs> outside of a programming interview. Who here has ever written radix sort at all, ever? Yeah? It didn't work very well for me, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, exactly. So practice, you know, that's something else in college, though, that I feel like students don't realize. I think I think all your points are really, really great on that. Uh, definitely 10,000 hours. And what I'm hearing is time and passion is a huge, uh, a huge thing on that. So that's definitely interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so I was going to say one thing that I think that 
So I, I'm a graduate from UNO. Mm -hmm. um, Me too, actually. CS. And uh, one thing I think that I never got out of that was, I, I got, okay, here's some algorithms, here's that. I never got an appreciation for how to actually show that my code works. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was nothing about testing, there was nothing about how would I ever take this thing and show to someone who's asked me to do this that this is actually the thing that they asked that they asked for. Mm -hmm. So testing or, or something along those lines. The other thing was um, a thing that I kind of learned later on that I never got out of my CS degree was how to split up a problem. Ooh, I have one. I have this huge set of requirements, and there's multiple ways I can see splitting it up. And quite often, the way programmers immediately go to is they think, "Oh, well, I'm going to have a, like a database layer." I'm going to have like the graphics later. I'm going to have some mishmash of stuff inside, mm -hmm. and then they start implementing it in that way. And then, and what I very quickly learned, uh, one of the big eye-opening things for me was, no, you don't approach it that way. Instead, you approach it through small slices of adding functionality. Mm -hmm. And that was when I learned how to do that. And it was really hard to figure out how do I split up a task? How do I split up a, a, a larger problem into these little vertical slices? Where at each point I can say, is this the thing that was actually asked for? And show an actual working system. Mm -hmm. When I learned how to do that, that made everything harder, but also easier at the same time. And that was not, never taught. Interesting. Yeah, that's a question that I get a lot from students is, uh, we at DigiBend give a lot of frameworks or test drivers or something like that. I don't for my classes. I don't believe in those. I believe in write the damn code your programmers. And I give them sample code that's just good enough to show how to do something, but not good enough that they could ever use it and get a grade higher than an F. But uh, the question I get is, this project is daunting. Where do I start? That's kind of what, uh, just where do I start? And then you learn about the slides. Where do I start? And how do I show progress? Ah, good one. How do you show progress? The, the uh, game, it's easy. Sit down, play the game. <laughs> not, not if you start out by saying, first I'm going to write a memory mapping system. Exactly. <laughs> True. Um, yeah. Uh, so maybe a, a fractional appreciation for like for ring patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Throughout my college career, like I never got any kind of like explanation of that even what a program pattern was. Um, and I think not only you need to know, you shouldn't have a class that like lists for ring patterns because that's dull and not useful. I would explain where you're presented with scenarios where a programming pattern is basically the way to do it, and any other way is kind of awful. And then you kind of you can realize what programming patterns go where, and you know what makes them useful, and not just the fact that they exist. Interesting. Okay, so a question on programming patterns. Then I have certainly learned firsthand. Here's pattern one. Here's pattern two. Here's pattern three is a bad way to teach patterns. And I've tried to integrate multiple patterns and combine them in interesting ways. So question I want to throw out there, would it be more useful to learn a small number of patterns fairly well or to be exposed to a large number of patterns somewhat shallowly? So yeah. Well, you want to learn a small number of patterns, but you want to learn them in an emergent way by making them work through the problem and so that they really get intimate with why you want to do things a certain way. Because otherwise it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. So if you want to do a version of design, basically, but keep it simple so they can keep it simple, keep it bound and focused so they can get that intellectual intimacy with what the actual problem space is. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last week I was in a talk by Al Shalloway, who was the author of Design Patterns and Plane. Mm -hmm. And he had an interesting take on it. He said, first patterns are nothing special. They're just something that people noticed that was in common over a couple of instances of, of code. And then it turned out to be useful. So just, just leaping off from that, what might be nice is to have the kids look for patterns discover patterns, to give a bunch of samples of code, and say, what do you see that's in common, and how could you abstract that out? Hmm. So would they then apply that as a refactoring to that? Yes. Or interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 So actually, just building really on what to say, and I think with patterns, rather than just the patterns, I believe the patterns actually exist in the problem. It's not, it's not about the presentation of head, but patterns also apply to solve problems. Patterns are abstractions of problems. Mm -hmm. I think maybe focusing on giving students problems first and then seeing 
Right, I mean, maybe you're picking some problems where there's some well-known patterns that do exist in that problem. Mm -hmm. And then so Sam, see if they can start to see the pattern. And they're kind of teaching that way. Rather than teaching like, you know, the canonical way to do the fact and abstract factory, you know, come up with a problem that really lends itself to that pattern. Because I, I really believe the problem the pattern is in the problem. It's something to do with code, it's something to do with and you know how how we implement the pattern actually is right there. Interesting. Okay, so give them code to solve by the pattern, and then let them discover the patterns is what I'm seeing. Interesting idea. Um, okay. So actually going back to the previous question, which will lead into potentially self-discovering patterns. Mm -hmm. If you were taught that writing code to de emphasizes delegation so that you can do true unit testing. Mm -hmm. So if your code is unit testable, most of the other patterns will fall out of making it unit testing. Definitely. I've noticed that over the years, definitely. Um, so this brings up an interesting question then that I am, um, okay, so where do I start? Where do we start teaching them? Do we start with the solid principles? Do we start with the discovery of pattern? Do we start with unit tests? I've seen some students, I try to introduce the idea of test doubles and I'll introduce mocks and I'll tell them for this assignment you must have at least 10 unit tests. My implementation has like 45, so you have to have at least 10. And you must use at least mock, you must use specifically a mock in at least one way in your tests. I use seven of them or something, right? And so I'll see, you know, create mock, you know, int value equals mock dot do something, assert value is correct. So they write the unit test testing the mock. Mm -hmm. After I tell them, you know, I give them examples, I show, and so it's like in one ear, out the other, right? So, uh, but definitely, you know, I like the idea of all of these things that they come together, where do we start with them? So, yeah. Well, this, go, this actually kind of goes to multiple questions that have been discussed. One thought I had is, if, well, where I found the easiest to learn design patterns, at a previous company, I led a discussion group where we went through a book on design patterns and we discussed each one, but we also thought about like how we could use that. If we did use it in our code base at the company, great. But if not, what if, what feature of our code base would be useful? Like, would be a good place to refactor and use that pattern as a common thing. And that also gets to the like readable, like being able to read somebody else's code. What about? Um, Starting everybody working on some like open source project and modifying an open source project. I once in a grad school class just did a very small modification, but didn't have to modify the Linux kernel for my OS grad level class. Nice. And um, so that's it teaches you to read other people's code. It forces you to figure out okay what to do next. And if you've got everybody starting from the same, working on the same open source project, you could potentially, um, I guess, have a project that you could then look at and see um, where, did, where does this project use that pattern, or where could this project use that pattern. You actually bring up something really interesting, too, and that's something that I've heard large number of people lament is not taught in, uh, in college, which is the, the idea of code reviews. Nobody learns how to review code in college. And I talk about code reviews and the difference between what I call a formal code review, where you all sit down in a room and your dev lead takes some code that was written by somebody who's not there anymore and just shreds it apart, hopefully somebody who's not there anymore at least, um, or you get people crying, which I've seen too. Then you have peer review, which is, here's my code, I want to check these changes in, what do you think? Oh, we can make these changes, well these are cool. It's kind of a, a bit of a safety net, but also kind of a, a, an informal spread of knowledge and, and learning, not only domain specific knowledge, but also uh, uh, just programming better practices knowledge throughout teams. So I see really in what you're saying a lot of, you know, we look at our code and find these places, find how to apply patterns, find from, you know, an open source project that other people have, have worked with how to read code. Where do code reviews fit in that? And how can we fit that as part of the entire process? Thoughts? Or other things? Shout them out, whatever you guys, uh, whatever you have. Yeah. In my master's program, if your code worked, that was important. Mm -hmm. But if it wasn't well, 
commented, well formatted, you got a zero. That was it. Mm -hmm. And it isn't your responsibility to teach rigor. And that really was teaching rigor. I mean, I know many students that have beautiful code that they think they got zeros. Mm -hmm. They failed the course because it had to be well read by the human. And I think that's important. The schools have to teach that. Definitely. And we have, to a certain extent, at least certain classes require them to do specific things. Your lines must be this number of characters or less. You must have this header comment at the start of your header files. You must have all files in, in you know, no caps and stuff. And if you, uh, the, the very first class students teach, you get assignment zero. It's worth zero points. However, it is something that teaches you, here's how to follow that. And what I tell students in my software engineering class is, you have these standards you have to follow. They're well-defined rules. Why on earth would you allow a human to potentially screw this up? Write a script and don't worry about it. And students are like, oh my god, I could have saved years of my life. So, yeah. One way to possibly uh, get students to appreciate or at least buy into things like book reviews and using uh, revision control systems mm -hmm. and writing documentation, all the, the external mechanics is that it's professional. This is what they're going to need when they go out in the real world. <coughs> so if they practice it now, then it will all become easy for them and they can just march right into some place and be a professional, even if they're still getting up to speed on things like the details of the code library or the details of the, the little tricks that you can do in some obscure language, they will have the tools down and that will be a roadblock. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and I've seen some very interesting things from students who go have an internship and then they come back and it's like, oh my god, in the real world, all of this stuff. Really eye-opening. Yeah? I uh, like what you're saying about um, peer reviews and how those are useful in uh, just looking at your code and thinking about it in a healthy way, as opposed to like uh, sitting down with a group of people and it's much, that's much more surgical, whereas uh, if you're just showing to another person, like a peer, talk about it, think about it, uh, get the chance to kind of uh, explore a little bit possibilities and get suggestions, where uh, to me that's a much more natural way to, to relate knowledge to someone, where, whereas if you're in a, in a group of people, it's more like, like a classroom, you have like a top-down kind of, this is the way we do code, your code conforms to X, Y, and Z, as opposed to let's explore this solution or talk about, you know, you can learn something Right? Mm -hmm. just talking to them. Yeah, that's good. And that actually happens a lot at Digipen. There's <coughs> students who sit in the back of the main lab. Everybody, and it's a different students every year. They cycle, but everybody knows who they are. If you have a question, they're the ones you go to. And some of the students that I see doing some of the most sophisticated stuff in their games, some of the best game engines, some of the best tech, are the ones who learn these concepts from you know the seniors, basically. And what I see students coming into my software engineering class is that some of them learned that stuff from the seniors and they already know it. The other half has never heard of any of it before and they don't know what's going on because they didn't talk to those particular seniors. And I'm trying to really kind of, especially just at Digipen, really make it not coincidence that you learn these things. I want it to be intentional, right? It's teaching by coincidence as opposed to teaching with intent, I guess. But, uh, you know, definitely a, a good point on that. So, how to encourage that? Um, yeah. I just want to say, getting back to that code review, I, I found it real worthwhile. I mean, you write the code yourself, and it makes sense. You know, of course, you have these mental leaps. But the next level is like just talk to somebody informally and say, "Here's what I intended this code to do," and that'll bring out the next level of, of uh, and that's so much better than the. You know, then they uh, put it up on the whiteboard or, mm -hmm. you know, be torn apart. That's way too threatening. You know, mm -hmm. that's just yeah. something that's going to happen. Well, I kind of like those formal code reviews sometimes. Because if you have somebody who's really senior, really knows what they're doing really well, they know more code about coding than I do and will for years, they'll get some code and I, I, they'll show things in that that I never would have thought of. But if it's my code that they're tearing apart, well, I, I don't care. I'm fine. I'm going to tear apart my code. Go nuts. Here, let me get you started with this file. Um, it's 4,000 lines long. It's in the .NET framework. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, <laughs> it used to be 10,000. But uh, you know, definitely, though, uh, 
peer feedback and just the one-on-one, -on -one, the, the knowledge transfer, getting ideas from each other, I think can definitely be very powerful. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to build on what said that with recent graduates, um, they also sort of an understanding of software processes sometimes mm -hmm. widely. Like, for example, the understanding of how certain like administrative functions, like say purity or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like the longer you wait to do that kind of stuff, like the effort that can go into it is be non-linear. So it's like, hey, if someone does it, you know, it's, you know, you do a story, it takes a day, someone does a review, that can take 10 minutes, but if it's like you wait a week, it's not like an hour, it's a couple of days. Mm -hmm. like, so those kinds of effects and kind of <coughs> that, um, mm -hmm. it seems to be that kind of There seems to be an absence of some of that knowledge, I've noticed. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I wish I'd learned before I started out too uh, too far along was that I would spend more of my time as a professional developer maintaining code than I would be writing code. And I don't know if that makes a difference in the way you would teach, and as opposed to everyone coming out thinking, oh, I'm going to go work on a greenfield project and I'm going to reinvent something awesome, and then then I'm going to run off to the next greenfield project, mm -hmm. and uh, while well, the rest of us are stuck doing brownfield. Right. Brownfield, and I tell students about Greenfield and Brownfield, it's called Brownfield, the shit field is already taken. But uh, yeah, I, I've tried, and there's, if I want to have students work on bad code, all I have to do is close my eyes, point to a coding class, grab the test driver from that class, and chances are they've got a good place to start, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, definitely, definitely this is true. Um, let's see, yeah. Have you thought of, um, you know, an exercise where one student writes code and the other one has to rewrite it? Um, that's called game class, unfortunately, <laughs> but yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah. I was <laughs> leveraging that. There's yeah. something called war pairing. War pairing? Yeah, war pairing where basically one person writes a method, the other the keyboard is handed over to the other person to write the unit test, and they must, ba they must break the method. Oh, if they nice. fail, then the roles switch. Interesting. So it, it basically drives, yeah. drives learning how to do good unit testability, but and it also turns into a sort of a personal game competition. Well, and it's, but it's a competition that everybody wins. Because as soon as you can't break the thing, then the rules change. And now you have to break the code you just wrote. And when that, both of you can't break it, then that method's done and you move on to the next method. Well, is the method done when you can't break it anymore, or that you found all the edge cases, or that you found all the business cases? Both of you cannot think of a way to break it. Well, I could think of a million ways to break code that's not ever going to happen in real life. From the unit test perspective. Offset of. <laughs> that? Yeah, offset of. You want me to break some code? Oh, your private dairy data number's in there. I can't get access to those. Oh, no. Right, please can't have those. <laughs> that you continue to break it by saying, oh, well, it was supposed to add numbers. Now it's all supposed to multiply them. Right. You just keep adding business rules onto what it's supposed to be. No, no, no. no. The idea is there's supposedly is an interface, and you're supposed to ah, honor the interface. Okay. You're not right. supposed to you're not supposed to go in and break it from by going going around the interface. But right, and that's my point also is that in terms of unit tests, what I'm what I've seen from students, I'll say try and break this code. They start to be very very creative how they manipulate the memory and throw void pointers around and do interesting things with it's that. About, so it's not about hacking it. About right. Trying to make it robust. <laughs> That's my question, though. Exactly is when they say break it. What? How do we define break? Is it is it a, a failure of a business rule or is it a crash? And, and what do you do to try to break code? Because because definitely you can break code no matter how hard you try to, to make somebody not be able to do something. Someone's going to figure it out. And that becomes more functionality, and then you can't change it. Right. And it's, it's more that you have to maintain, so it you know increases your total cost of ownership <laughs> for cases that may not ever happen in the real world. Exactly. And when they do, it's a company that's paying millions of dollars and I have to support it because it's a feature. Yeah. Okay. It's a trade-off. Right? Yeah, definitely a trade-off. That's an interesting idea for that exercise. It's just, I, I wonder what students would do in terms of how to break this code. But competitive is good at Digit Pen. Students are very competitive. So, uh, uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, in terms of it's kind of anti-competitive, but it's always like pair programming is a very good skill. And I mean, you can pair like he's talking about, but literally just having people looking at the code and switching up who write stuff periodically. 
and making sure that both people are engaged and also getting people to discuss the best approaches. And even if you're not caring all the time, knowing when to grab somebody else and get talk somebody else to be your code or get another opinion is a very good skill. Yeah, I have one quick question you mentioned on paired programming. Who here, when you first learned about paired programming, said, oh my god, we're going to be half as productive? Who, be honest, who said that? Or who thought that or wondered about that? Be honest. Yeah, I know, it's a lot of people. Okay, so what did it take to show that that was not the case? When did you change your mind? Or what convinced you to try it? Were you compelled to try it and discover, oh wow, this is great? You know, what, what, what happened with that? Yeah. I was over at the old Jigsaw Renaissance location. We were having a hackathon, and I realized that a version of the web services framework I had was out of date. I did a git pull of web five. Somebody stood up and said, hey, what happened to the network? And I said, oh, whoops. whoops. Control C, Control C. And there I was with a dead copy of the web framework that we were working on. And so I turned to the guy next to me. take you then? A week. How long would it take you now? Oh, probably about an hour and a half, maybe. All right, progress. They don't even realize it. But that is an interesting idea. I really like that. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, going off that, um, or from that, what if, rather than taking the code they did, well, they did a year ago for that class, what if you let them use their code from a year ago or any of their classmates' code from the year ago. So they know the domain that it's answering, but they may, 
they can use their code if they remember it, or they can use somebody else's cleaner code, who was one of their classmates. Interesting idea. I do let people do, uh, 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 force them to swap code. Actually, that's, to a certain extent, I can't necessarily force them to swap code because of FERPA and other privacy uh, uh, laws, basically. Like, I can't just uh, arbitrarily pull somebody's assignment uh, then say, this person got a C on this assignment, make it an A grade. That I can definitely not do. Um, but potentially, especially pulling their code, if they get the permission from uh, uh, their friends, or if they give me permission to throw their code on the board in class and do a code review, you, you don't want to do that. Don't, don't let me do that to your code. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, definitely an interesting idea. Um, yeah. Sort of related to that, I, mean, I never had one of this yesterday, but one of the things I've seen in the business world is that there are a lot of people who don't know sort of the process around keeping their code around, like the sort control and mm -hmm. those kind of things. And so the idea of like going back to the years ago, code, who of your students ever has that code anymore? And where would they ever get it, right? And so there's like business processes where it's like, well, you know, as a group of developers, like, Know, two weeks of vacation, they're gone, they come back and their hard drive's gone, and all their code. Whoops. And so it's things like that where it's like, how do you teach that process in, that, in the middle of that? We actually store uh, student assignments for the submission, so I can, even if it's gone, I can get IT to restore it for backup. So I can get their code back, but yes, a lot of students don't understand version control at all, or they don't know how to use it effectively. And unfortunately, a lot of companies uh, don't really use version control very effectively either. It's like, oh, well, this whole thing has to be one check-in. I'm like, what? So, so patches don't work in your version control? You don't have to use patches? Instead of, you can only diff one version back instead of here's where I started, here's where I ended, review that. You don't understand how diffs work? Grep, it's a, it's a program. You can use grep. You're familiar with grep? So that's uh, my rant on things. It's related things like, you know, storing, like, stuff, you know, uh, encryption keys and stuff like that in your code that mm -hmm. are now lost and maybe they're going to expire. And Oh no, they're expiring in three hours. How do we have to do it? Oh yeah, it's like yeah. Uh, yeah, and I've seen some students do weird things with version control. I have seen subversion repositories inside of subversion repositories. Because, you know, God, I heard you like subversion, so <laughs> uh, bad memories. Um, yeah. Yeah, you asked earlier uh, about your first experience of pair programming, and mine was. Um, in a coding dojo uh, in, uh, in in England, in Brighton, in England. So we uh, every couple of weeks, uh, six or seven of us got together, and uh, we went in the offices of this. I think it was a games company actually, and um, we did pair programming um, using this Randori system, where one of you is the driver, one of you is the navigator, and uh, everything's thrown up onto a huge screen, so everyone can see what's going on. And then every five minutes or so, someone rings a bell usually, and and um, everyone shifts around one, one chair. And so not only was I pair programming, but also um, I had like you know six other people looking at my code as I was doing it. And the pressure was, was immense. And the first couple of <laughs> sessions was, was utterly uh, intimidating and exhausting. But eventually I realized that uh, I was learning so much so quickly because there were all these great people around me just you know helping with every, every move. And, and since then I've, I've, I've set up this mob mob programming group in Seattle based on the ideas of, um, uh, based on how a company in San Diego is working where they have eight people in their team and this is what they do all day. They code together as a team actually, not even pairs, like that's what they do 40 hours a week, all coding together and they say there that even though it sounds incredibly inefficient as you were alluding to ever ago, the, the amount of learning that goes on there is, is, is tremendous. Definitely. And one thing also, and this is something one of, one of my sayings, everybody has something to contribute. So those of you who haven't said anything yet, you have something to contribute, but you realize it or not. And what you said, you know, I'm surrounded by all these great people who are teaching me stuff, and, and you know, they, they learn just as much from you as, uh, as you did from them. And people don't always realize that when, when they're going to hear something. It's like, I don't understand any of this. All these people are dragging me along through the project, right? You don't even realize the things that you really, truly really do understand. And you never know if somebody else, you know, maybe they don't know those things. They're not going to tell you necessarily, right? But uh, definitely collaboration and just learning from each other. Everybody always has something to contribute. There's always a topic at some point where everybody here is the expert in the room on that one thing. I guarantee you that topic exists for everybody here, always. That's just a uh, thing. So on that note, people who haven't said anything yet, uh, and feel free, if you have another topic, if you want to change the direction of the conversation, if you have something totally unrelated, 
Um, you know, shout them out, whatever you have. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the one thing that I from into in my personal projects is I'll just go down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll come up with this great idea and then I'll spend so much time planning it. Oh, yes. That I never actually do anything. Mm -hmm. And how do, how do you, you know, I think one of the things for a lot of people is, you know, how to just break out of that pattern and just start writing. Yes, I had a student to actually I'm in the study with right now who had exactly that problem and just couldn't get started. I said, okay, and we, we picked a vertical slice. I, I chose a vertical slice for him and said, how would you write this code? It's like, well, class is up. All that. And who really cares about the object model? Write the code, hard code it, break all the rules, just make it work by any means necessary right now, do it. Now let's refactor. Yes, I see students with a lot of that, they're thinking hard, or they're planning, or they're like, well, let's figure out how we're going to do this, then we'll just write it, and then they'll get halfway through and they'll realize their plan was dumb, and now they can't change it. Um, but definitely, it goes back to that, where do I start, how do I do this, and not knowing how to slice a chunk of that project off. Yeah. I just want to contribute to that idea. Um, I'm a relatively new developer, and so what I've discovered really works for me, especially kind of working and learning on my own, is that I go through kind of a, a brainstorming process. I don't write any tests. Um, I might have like a cheap diagram or something, but I'll just make something hideous and ugly that kind of approaches this vague idea I have in my head. And now because I can see it and I can play with it, now I'm like, all right, I don't want any of this. This is a good idea. You know, like I, ha I have a clear, kind of picture of what works and what doesn't. Now I go back and write my unit tests and my, uh, and my integration tests, and then I start to build off of what I have there, piece by piece, you know, using the acceptance test. Right, so you just start out with a spike, basically, on your own code. Yeah. Let's figure out what I'm doing. Let's figure out how to break this down. Yeah. Then that gives you an idea, interesting idea. I do that a lot, too, actually. Yeah? For me, I don't know, I don't know if for other, for me, I don't think once I saw the build framework in, in operation, mm -hmm. I don't know. file, create a test directory, run back the zip, same process, return zero if everything was successful in such a free project. But uh, that way I can give them some scripting practice while they also learn about build. But I'm a huge believer in build and build automation because I've done it in almost anywhere I've ever worked as I have been compelled to for reasons I don't understand. But uh, same thing, I remember the first time, the first time I really screwed up the website deployment. Um, that was the last one. Like, I'm done with this. There's got to be a better way. And I Googled it, and that was my discovery of everything that we talk about. I found a blog post by uh, uh, J.P. Budo, actually, I think, uh, about building with Nant. This was .NET 2.0 had just come out. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is cool. I wonder what else this can do. Oh, look. And that was where bloggers would tag five other bloggers in a post. And so I just started writing. I suddenly had like 40 blogs I was reading. But, Definitely, definitely. Back up with my start. So that I have a lot of passion for, for Bill just kind of because of that positive association. Uh, yeah, play the back. Question is I'm not a professional programmer on this, I thought that I'd ask you a question, but is reading other people's code good use of time? And if so, how much what's the how much time should you spend reading other people's code versus writing code versus thinking about what you're gonna write? Great question. Yeah, I, my answer would be yes, it can be very valuable. It's not just one, two, three, read code. Okay, I read their code. Next step, right? That that wouldn't be. But uh, but what do you all think about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So I think in terms of reading code, it's it's valuable if if you're reading code that's useful for your projects. So if you have to go through a library and find out, okay, why is this not working or that sort of thing, you're still reading code and you're still also kind of thinking about your own code and how that fits into this code. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. that 
I uh, was in a digital design class where we were doing a little bit process and I was working with uh, another woman and we would take our designs and we would each hand each other a stack of paper and she would read mine and then she'd get to a point and say, I don't understand this. And I rapidly learned that when she said, I don't understand this, and I had made a mistake. <laughs> Oh, I was, oh yeah, I was going to be about oh. reading code. Um, I think one of the things is also when reading code to teach how to read code. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because quite often, Definitely. like you, you read code and you just read through and you're like, oh, it's an if statement. It's a sign. Yeah. But you, I think to, to me, you have to teach the reflectively reading code. You pay attention to the way you're reacting as you read it and think about why you're reacting that way. Like, why did I think this was hard to understand? Recognizing code smell. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's really that kind of reflective practice of being able to improve, and you have to practice that. Yeah. Now, I want to get my answer actually on that. You all mentioned a lot of great things about uh, reading code, and especially reading your own code or your teammates' code or your own projects. I say every time you read code, it can be beneficial to them to just say, "I want to read through some code right now that somebody else has written and try to understand it." And that gets back to ten thousand hours, right? You can read your code, but the only time you're ever reading somebody else's code is when you are compelled to do so for a business reason or to work on a project or to find bugs or something like that. That's a performance of your reading code skill. You know, you're, you're rolling the dice to see if you can read the code. Natural 20, there's a bug. You know, but uh, uh, I think that just practicing reading other code from anywhere else and look at why is this code good, why is this code bad. Like imagine I compared the code between, say, RhinoMox and uh, OpenSSL. Please, God, don't open OpenSSL ever. But uh, uh, yeah, just uh, But uh, same thing. But even still, looking at that code is really, really valuable. Why do I hate this code so much? Why do I want to stab this person with a toothpick? You know, that's that's it's, it's a good exercise always, I think, just in terms of practicing. And the question is, how much do you practice? So um, yeah. I think uh, the underlying principle here is that uh, as a developer, you don't have all knowledge, you don't have a perfect knowledge, you can always learn something. And when you're in school, it feels like, okay, I'm learning this, I'm learning this, and when I'm done, I'm learning all these things. I'll have everything I need to be a developer, right? But <laughs> you should realize that you're just getting started. And as a professional developer, you owe it to, to yourself to spend time, and you owe it to your teammate, teammates too, I think, to spend time learning how other people write code, trying to learn from that, and you know, spending some time developing things that you don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. And developing your knowledge because everybody has an insufficient knowledge. Oh, and definitely. You're not a professional, I think, unless you're trying to improve that and, and understand how other people write code. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've noticed that too. I just was messing around with compute shaders a while ago, and I finally got to the point where I'm doing something complicated with compute shaders. I'm like, I totally own compute shaders. I'm trying to do something different. And uh, I realized just how little I really know about graphics programming in general. And so that's sometimes you think you're great at something, and then once you master something you think will make you great at it, only then do you realize just how crappy you really are at that one subject. It's so all the time. Yeah. Well, I was going to say about the code that, that it's a fine art to figure out a good variable name. And mm -hmm. variable names lead right into readability and understanding of the code. And I suppose, you know, just reading other people's code, I, I can't come up with them. Mm -hmm. You know, this set of guidelines will make you, you know, have a great variable name. But oh, yeah. reading other people's code, trying to understand, will kind of give you that gut feel over time about what's a good variable name. Absolutely. And another thing is that I think variable naming is contextual as well, which is a good or bad. So for example, in graphics programming, we work with you know a dozen different coordinate spaces. And so when I have a matrix, I will not name my matrix, you know, matrix world transform. I will name it matrix world space from local space, right? Or local space to world space. Or I have, you know, position MDC for normalized device coordinates, position uh, homogeneous coordinates, position world coordinates, stuff like that. And so that in graphics, I taught that to another graphics programmer recently, and suddenly a lot of bugs just went away because he's no longer accidentally a matrix somewhere or accidentally a, a vector something. It just 
You know, so definitely that can be really super, super important. But then I get some people who are all like, oh, well, you know, you've got a Marian notation, and that's what we do for variable naming conventions, mm -hmm. we should do that. And then I say, well, have some Gary or systems on Gary, and then that distracts them long enough that they don't slap coming. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, but yeah, definitely. Like that, it should use a debugger. Well, uh, these are students working on a, a very large, complex web service platform mm -hmm. that has a whole layer of framework added on top of the original web service mm -hmm. uh, platform. And besides, web requests are pretty darn obscure anyway. Right. So they would get to it, and it would scare them. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell them, set a breakpoint. Yeah, just trace through the code. I, I, when I work with legacy code, sometimes the first thing I'll do is I just set a breakpoint. Let's just see what it does. I type this, yeah. bam, breakpoint. In fact, one thing well, I had really, really powerful, I was working with a GUI system totally from scratch uh, last semester. And I was like, OK, where does my system think the mouse is right now over what control? And so if I left click, it does stuff. Right click, I just put start of that thing that processes that. If, you know, input system, global singleton, dangerous, get access, is right mouse click down, debug break. So anytime I hit the right mouse click, it would immediately debug break right there and throw me right into the code. That was invaluable. So sometimes with games especially, you can't just, you know, I want this to break precisely on frame 473. You can't really do that. You can't single step your 473 frames to get right to that point in physics. So I've had some, some creative ways to do that. But definitely, just even how to use a debugger. Although, one thing you mentioned web services is that I, I do a lot with networking, and I've gotten really deep into just scalability. And the debugger, as you're working with low-level networking code, the debugger gradually starts to become more and more useless to you. Because you can't hit a breakpoint over a network. Well, you can. It's really, really hard to do. But uh, you can't step through multiple computers on the network really realistically. And so at that point, printf debugging asserts um, things blowing up in a way that's that you know, we use traces to figure out how it blew up, log files, stuff like that, just suddenly become goal to me at least, way more so than in certain other types of programming. But anyway, uh, how are we doing? All right, uh, about five minutes left. So final thoughts, things, what, you know, what did you wish you learned in college? What do you wish that intern that just started your company knew? Um, you know, one question that I have for everybody, so a class typically has a particular focus. Here's how you code in C++. Here is how graphics programming is done. Here is how physics programming is done. Here is how a database works. Here's, you know, there's a theme to each class. What should the role of software engineering and good coding play in classes where the focus of the class is on something that isn't explicitly that? What do you think? Expected. Minimum expected. If you can't, if you can't even do the clean code, it doesn't matter how well you're doing the database thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the minimum we expect is that it works. So make it so that the minimum you expect is that you're doing this, the software engineering okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's important to show that that if you do have good code, then it'll make your life a lot easier in these other classes. So that that bug that you spent an hour trying to fix is not actually going to be there because you know you write your method in the one thing that I ran into when we had a study out of college, they would go to the internet and grab whatever, like database access, stringing together the SQL commands to see binary SQL injection. Mm -hmm. And it just it's like just because something's on the internet doesn't mean that that's the right way to do it. Definitely. Yeah, trust no one. I have <laughs> I have definitely seen that. Hell, I've put, you know, sample code, a whole bunch of spaces way off the screen, minus 20 copy. I tell them, don't copy my sample code. And then those comments are there. I know if you're copying it. I can tell. Believe me, I can tell. Yeah?
how to be a team, how to do you know, either some simplified lean or agile project management, you know, how to manage your time, how to keep documentation, that kind of stuff, even while they're just barely learning the program. And then it's the, it's the thing that they know already and carry it around to all the other classes. Okay. Here's one more question then. Should software engineering in terms of practices, SDLC and whatnot, even be in the same class as how to write good code, <coughs> software engineering in terms of you know, software as just the actual software itself. That's that's the fundamental difference between writing code and writing software, right? Because code is code, and code code doesn't have to provide business value. It has to perform a function. Writing software has to deliver some kind of business value and it has to be maintainable. I think, like Chris was saying earlier, you're in, you're in this class, you've got a project. Oh, I just need to write this code. This algorithm needs to do this. Needs to meet these requirements. Boom, I'm done, and I'm never going to touch it again. In the real world, you never write code that you're never going to touch again. As soon as you write your code, it's legacy code. Oh yeah, I'm going to make. <laughs> I saw a few other hands over here, so stuff, feel free to back out. Yeah, the first uh, programming class that I took was completely how to write, how to write programs, but using pseudocode. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't actually any, you know, any language to learn at that point, which was helpful. But what I think what it lacked was the approach of how to write software. So actually, uh, just a couple days ago, I started reading uh, The Clean Coder by Robert Martin, and also uh, Clean Code, which is phenomenal to me. Like, you know, revolutionary in how I understand uh, the process of writing, writing code. And pretty much everything that we've said today has been kind of echoed in that book. So it's, it's not great to me. Okay, cool. Let's check out that book, actually. I've been, I've been a little bit behind on just books in general lately. It's bad. What, what was it called again? Uh, the Clean Coder is one of Clean Coder is the other. So Clean Coder is more like, kind of like standards and, and, and practices following. Uh, the Clean Coder is more about uh, kind of just the approach. Okay, cool. I'll check them out. Yeah. Over. Oh, I, I know other people have talked about uh, the importance um, of learning tools. And I, I just wish I had learned earlier you know, how enjoyable it is to, to uh, customize my editor or my shell mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things. Yes. They, they have really led to you know, the, the uh, sense of um, you know, passion and just the enjoyment of just doing everything else that I have. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I, I tell students to the most useful short record to learn in Visual Studio ever. Control Alt A, open space, and then start typing a file name. I have ten thousand files open. Control Tab, where is my file? I can't find it. The solution. There's ten thousand files. I can't find it. I know it's named this. Control Alt A, open space, and tell it sends the file name. Enter. It's there. You're done. How many hours has that saved me over the last few years? All of them. Um, or do you use Resharp and Control Shift N? Well, Resharp for C++ is really a thing. There's Visual Assist, but it's not quite as good. But I, I can't tell what goes. Um, all right, anything else? Final thoughts? We're just about out of time. Um, any last minute uh, advice, things to share? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. There's a lot of great stuff here. And, uh, I, I hope that uh, you know all of you maybe learned something from each other today also. Great discussion. So, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I thank you guys for being here. I think, uh, no, pizza's all gone. I think this is the yeah. first. It was Saturday. Pizza's all gone. gone. But anyways, thank you guys for coming. What? There's cold beer. There's cold beer? There's still beer. There's beer in the back. We'll grab some beer for one. still beer. We'll go flat. Anyways, thank you. We'll see you guys next month. Have a great week. Thank you.